you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd like you to open them with me to the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis. This morning we come to the account of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We began to talk about this last week by addressing some important questions. The first, does God have a right to judge? Does God have a right to judge us? Does God have a right to judge the world? And I hope we discovered that he not only has the right to do so, uh, he has the responsibility to do so. If he ceased to be just, he would cease to be good. And if God has no outrage at sin and evil, then he's not good. And we also talked about the fact that God exercises his right to judge. The Bible tells us he does it every day. We don't know. Uh, we're not prophets. Uh, we don't have prophets to explain to us this or that event, either in a person's life or in the happenings among the nations. Uh, nevertheless, the Bible assures us that God is active. The difference between what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah and perhaps some act of God's judgment that is falling at this very hour, is God told Abraham what he was about to do and why he was going to do it. And this led to another question we answered, is God just when he judges? Does he judge the wicked and the guilty? Uh, does he somehow rain fire from heaven in an indiscriminate way? and look upon some who are really not worthy of that judgment as nothing more than collateral damage. And Abram wanted to know that, and he asked God, and God assured him that no, when the judgment falls, when divine judgment is visited upon an individual or a people, we can be certain that it will always be proportionate and just. Now, the same event may touch both the righteous and the wicked, but God will use that event differently in the lives of the righteous than he does in the wicked. In the lives of the wicked is judgment. But in the life of a righteous person, that which is judgment for the wicked may actually be used by God, actually it will be used by God for good. Uh, we left off there because Abram left off there. Uh, he understood that God had the right to judge, and he came to understand that God would be right when he judged. But he was concerned about Sodom and Gomorrah because he had family there. His nephew Lot, uh, his uh, Lot's wife, Excuse me, I'm having a mental black here, blackout here. I have that every once in a while. See, that's what happened. James is right. The sugar donuts and the jelly in them, it's a bad thing to eat right before you come up here. Now, I just took a little piece of a roll that had that really good peanut butter frosting in it. And, oh, man, I'm having a sugar rush for sure here today. So, so bear with me if I have some lapses and, and my mind would suddenly quit working as it just did. But Abraham had relatives there. He had his, lot, his nephew Lot, Lot's wife. And Lot had two daughters. And so the announcement that God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah concerned Abraham because he had a personal stake, at least in some of the people in the city. But God had assured him that he would handle matters and that Abraham could trust God to do the right thing. And so we read what happened next, beginning with verse 1. Now the two angels, the two angels that had accompanied the angel of the Lord, came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into my, your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise and, and go on your way early. They said, however, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. 
Yet he urged them strongly so that they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked on leavened bread. And they ate. Now, before they laid down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old. That's significant. Remember that. All the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to them, him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like, only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand aside. Furthermore, they said, This one came in as an alien, and already he's acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against them. So, excuse me. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the door of the house with blindness, both the small and the great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Then the two men said to Lot, Who else do you have here? A son-in-law? Uh, I am really struggling here. A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters. And whoever you have in this city, bring them out of this place. For we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent, it, sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-laws who were to marry his daughters, and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his son-in-laws to be jesting. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. And when they had brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to it. It is a small town. Let me escape there. Is, is it not small that my life may be saved? And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the town was called Zoar. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar, and then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife, from behind him, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Now Abraham rose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley, and he saw, and behold, uh, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Thus it came about, when God destroyed the cities of the valley, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities that Lot lived in. We're going to talk uh, specifically about Lot Lord willing, next Sunday. Uh, but we're going to try to look at this general picture this morning and draw some lessons from what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, pardon me for my reading. I don't know what was wrong today. I was not reading well. I hate that. I, I love to try to read the Scripture well. Uh, sometimes if I read the Scripture well, even if I blow the sermon, you get something then. 
And uh, but uh, this morning uh, again, that donut really got to me. You know, it really uh, kind of a funny feeling. I, I I've been kind of dieting, so I haven't had much sugar lately. And uh, so so that's I'm sure what happened here this morning. I broke uh, broke the rule. Uh, but what happened here? Of course, the two uh, there had been three angels or angelic beings that had appeared to uh, to Lot, uh, to Abraham. One of them was the angel of the Lord. We know the angel of the Lord to be not an angel, not a created being, but the ultimate messenger of the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he often appeared in the Old Testament in the form of the angel of the Lord. And so the angel of the Lord is the one who talked with Abraham and explained to him in detail what he was going to do and assured him that he could trust God to be just in the judgment that was about to fall on these cities. It was late in the afternoon, apparently, when these two angels that had accompanied the angel of the Lord arrived in Sodom. And it was an ordinary enough day. Uh, no doubt people had got up that morning and prepared their breakfast, and they had gone about business as usual throughout the day. There were no doubt weddings that were being planned. In fact, Lot's wife was probably in the middle of wedding preparations uh, because the two daughters of Lot had become engaged to two men there in Sodom. And uh, so preparations for a wedding were being made. Uh, Lot was sitting at the gate of the city, and that tells us something because we know that this is where legal business was done. This is where the judges and the men of importance sat and rendered judgment in civil matters. And the fact that Lot was sitting there indicates that he had probably become a, a, a player in the local politics of Sodom. He was apparently a man of, of some influence, perhaps even a judge. And later, uh, when they're attacking Lot, they're going to say, you, you came in as, a, as an alien, and you're already judging us. And this may be reference to the fact that, that he had become so respected in the city that he had become a judge. And that, perhaps, was due to the fact that his uncle Abraham had saved the city of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, when it had been attacked and conquered uh, by kings from the north. Uh, the entire population had been taken captive and were going to spend the rest of their days as slaves. And suddenly Abraham and his friends and his servants fell upon the armies from the north and they defeated them and they rescued all of the hostages. And because of, of Lot's relationship to Abraham, it's, it's very likely that that gained him some notoriety and some status, some status there within the city of Sodom. And as he sees these two strangers come to town, we have an indication that Lot was a righteous man. Now in the book of Jude, and we're going to look at that some next week, it actually says he was a righteous man. When you look at what he's doing here, and what you're going to see him doing in the passage we're going to look at next week, you might say, I don't think he looks very righteous. Uh, but to someone living in the ancient Near East, reading the book of Genesis for the first time, they would see Lot's reaction to the sight of these two angels as an indication that Lot was a good and righteous man. Because hospitality is a big deal in, in the Middle East to this day. And particularly so in ancient days. Uh, this is one of the things we mentioned a few weeks ago, that when Abraham saw these angels, he had the same reaction. He immediately got up and ran to them and fell on his face before them and pleaded with them for the privilege of showing them hospitality. And we see the same thing from Lot. And so someone reading this would say, there is a righteous man in Sodom. Here is a man who, like his uncle Abraham, is pleading for the privilege of showing hospitality. Uh, two strangers have arrived and he is begging them uh, to come to his house uh, so that he can wash their feet. Now this would not have been Lot's job. No doubt a servant would have handled this task. But he, he would show them hospitality. They would stay the night and then they could continue on in their journey the next day. might also have been true that 
Abraham feared uh, for these men. He knew the city he was living in. And he might well have known uh, that if he did not show these men hospitality, they would indeed have to stay in the city square and they would be unsafe there. There certainly seems to be an urgency as Abraham is, is entreating them to come to his house. And they're resisting. They're saying, no. What am I saying? Uh, it, could it be that you're hearing me wrong? Okay. We're talking about Lot. Abraham's up in the hills. Okay. So Lot is entreating them, saying, come on into my house. Uh, c come on. And they're saying, no, we'll stay in the square. And, uh, and he knows they're not going to be safe, I think. And so he is saying, no, come home with me. And so finally, they agree to that. And we read that he is a, a, a very hospitable host, like his uncle Abraham. Uh, Lot is determined to feed these men well. And when we read that he prepared a feast for them, and the mention of unleavened bread, some have taken that to say, well, he was not as hospitable as his, as his uncle. And yet that was the common bread. Still is in that part of the world. We mentioned a few weeks ago, that's chapati. Uh, that is the daily bread of most of the world. Uh, that's flat bed cooked on, on a rock or something or uh, on some sort of griddle. And, and so he prepared a, a lavish dinner for them. And they were going to spend the night. They were preparing to go to bed when the mob arrived. But the mob here is quite unique. And I think its composition seals the fate of the city. Remember, the angels were on the last fact-finding mission before the judgment of God reigned upon this civilization. God was going to take an extraordinary uh, action here and that he was going to destroy, uh, destroy a, a, an entire civilization. But he said, before I do it, I want to check one more time and make sure it is really as bad as, uh, as I already know it is, but I'm going to check one more time. And we read that this isn't just a mob of the, uh, of the neighborhood ruffians. This isn't just a group of, of ne'er-do-wells out looking for trouble. Uh, not a group of people that have been inflamed in their passions by some movie depicting their prophet in an unfavorable light. Uh, the whole city turns out. And we are told that it's the young and the old. And what we need to understand by that, it isn't just the adults. It's the kids. Sodom has become a place in which evil is being manufactured generation after generation. And they're showing up uh, to commit a horrid sexual crime. And the whole city has turned out to enjoy or to participate in the spectacle. And so what we are seeing here is just... What a wicked place Sodom was. Everyone in town is corrupt. Even the young. Uh, the virus of wickedness has spread throughout the entire body of Sodom. Now, we live in a day and age in which it's politically incorrect to talk about the sin that was committed there. If you watch these goofy shows, you know, the mysteries of the Bible or something, they'll say that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was that they were not hospitable. Well, I will agree that homosexual rape is not a hospitable act. But when you read the Bible, it says that these men not only were inhospitable, it talks about them in Ezekiel, but they committed abominations before the Lord. Uh, I have a lot of old commentaries, and it's amazing how discreet they are in even talking about this sin. They say, boy, we live in a different age. Within 50 years, we've gone from uh, discretion to absolute brazenness. And it, it, one, one of the passages in the Bible condemns Sodom, and it's actually condemning Israel. It says, you guys are just like Sodom in that you display your sin and you're not ashamed of it. And here you see that. 
This is a sexually corrupted civilization. Perversion. And they saw these two angelic beings. They thought they were good-looking young men. And they intend to perform gang rape on them and enjoy the spectacle. All the people, from every quarter, it says, gathered. Now, you have to understand what Lot did next. You see, he went out and said, don't do this. And you say, he's going to give his daughters to the mob and say, rape my daughters and said... Uh, yeah, that, that's horrid, and it shows how much perhaps Sodom had gotten into the heart of, of Lot. But it's actually in keeping with Middle Eastern custom. And that's what he's saying, don't do this. Take my daughters instead, because these men have come under my ha house, uh, and under the, my roof. And what he is actually trying to do is implore them and say, what a wicked thing. I'm willing to give you my daughters rather than allow you to... Uh, to cause my hospitality uh, to be tramped under the foot of your immoral passions. Uh, and no doubt he would have done so. This is how important hospitality was in the ancient Near East. And Lot was willing to sacrifice his own daughters rather than to allow his guests uh, to be violated. And again, if you were reading this in the ancient Near East, you wouldn't have been as shocked. You might have said, well, he is a righteous man. I uh, say, really, they're that much different than us. Yeah, they really were. Uh, aren't you glad, ladies, that you weren't born in that era? Uh, we have a lot of things we can be thankful for, and, and that surely is one of them. Uh, but they're not interested in that, and they, they turn on Lot at this point in time, and and they say, you know, you came in as an alien already, you're a judge. We're going to treat you worse than they, we were going to treat them. And, and the scene is they attack Lot, and they begin to push on Lot up against that door. And they're pushing so strong, the door's about to break. And the angels then reach and grab Lot and pull him in, and they perform a miracle, those who are trying to get into the house. Uh, they're blind, they're, they're groping around. The angel shut the door and says, What do you have in this town? You have any other relatives? You got any son in laws? Anyone else in this town? And Lot did have two young men that he was apparently very fond of, young men who were due to marry his daughters. And remember, it doesn't say that everyone in the mob was blinded, just the most aggressive, those who were trying to get in the door. And so he goes out into the mob once again, getting past those who are trying to assault him, and he finds his son-in-laws, and he says, we've got to get out of here. God's going to destroy the city. And uh, they say, yeah, <laughs> that, that's good, Lot. That's, uh, that's funny. Maybe you had too much to drink tonight. Uh, God doesn't do things like that. And so Lot goes in and realizes what we got is what you see. This is it. The next morning, Lot and his family are still sleeping. The angels are awake. And they wake them up and says, it's time to leave. The sun is just coming up, we're told. It's dawn. Good time of the day to get up and get moving, right? And we hear that Lot hesitated. Even though say, if you stay here, you're going to be overtaken in the punishment of this city. But Lot hesitated. And you would hesitate too. It was a nice home. Had an open floor plan, uh, a great view from the patio, and you know the master suite was great. It's got a and what what do we call it? Got had beautiful ensuite right off the master bedroom, and uh, you know it, it's a hard place to leave. Granite countertops. I, I mean, this was the good life. I mean, Sodom had its downside, but you know, when it comes to creature comforts. Not a bad place to live. And the angels grab his hand. One of them grabs the wife's hand. The other one gets the two daughters. And it says they get him out of town. I don't know if they just immediately were outside the gates. Because Lot seems to have a sudden realization that this is serious. It's really going to happen. Because he says, you saved my life. 
and these angels are... We read that the compassion of the Lord was on the family of Lot. And so these angels are there and they say, Now run for your life. Because God is going to destroy this entire valley. He's even going to burn the ground so that it never is productive again. Get out of here. And Lot says, uh, No. I, it, to me, I, I read that and I find that amazing. Uh, he, he is, you know, almost assaulted himself the night before. Angels take him outside. He now has come to believe that indeed the city is going to be destroyed. Uh, and, and they say, get, get to the mountains. He says, no, I can't do that. It's not me. I'm kind of a city boy. I don't know if I'd make it in the mountains. Now, one of the cities here, there are five cities on the plain, and, and that one over there, it's really small. You know, let me go there. And the compassion of the Lord was upon the family of Lot, really for the sake of Abraham. And the angel says, okay, but get there quickly, because I can't touch this place until you're there. And we read that it was about noon then, when Lot finally stepped foot inside of Zorar, and suddenly the fire of God fell on the entire valley and wiped it out so that uh, the smoke of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah could be seen from a distance by Abraham the next morning. It was like a smoke coming up from a, a great furnace. But Lot and his family were saved, except for his wife. And we read that she looked back. The angel said, don't do it. He said, don't look back. Just get out of town. If you look back, you're going to be overcome. And the idea of looking back here, uh, from what I read, it can mean more than she was just glancing over her shoulder. It, it really kind of has the idea that she was looking and maybe thinking, I'm going to go back. This is foolishness. When suddenly she was overtaken and whatever the destruction was, and you can read the commentaries on, on how God may have used natural forces here, uh, to cause this event. Uh, they, by the way, think they found Sodom and Gomorrah. Some, and uh, the archaeological ruins are just like it's described in the Bible. Uh, fire that began on the roof of the houses and burnt them all down. And even fire on the ground. It was a, a terrible, cataclysmic judgment that fell on these cities. And uh, through something, the force of the explosions or whatever... Lot's wife was covered with salt and turned into a pillar of salt. And a lot of the ancient historians say, I've been there and seen it. Well, we don't know if it was the actual pillar of salt or people are saying, yeah, there she is. But uh, what a story. What are we to make out of this? Uh, what are our applications for today? You know, Jesus actually gave us some applications from this story. And I think, uh, you know, if we're going to look at something like this and say, what should we take away from it? If Jesus talked about it, that'd be a good place to look, don't you think? Turn to the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. The section in which Jesus was talking about his second coming. And of course, as a prelude to his coming, there are once again going to be cataclysmic judgments poured out upon the entire earth by God. Verse 22, Jesus begins to talk to his disciples and he said, The days will come when you will see the Son of Man and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there, look, look here. Do not go away, and do not run after them. For just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. The son of man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. 
It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying and selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, and the other left. And answering, they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said, Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Jesus uh, references Sodom and Gomorrah here. A lot of people say his point is simply that the Son of Man is going to come. He is going to return at a time when people are unexpected and they're not looking for it. Because that seems to be the point with both uh, the days of Noah <coughs> excuse me, and the days of Lot. I think there's more to it than that. Because in both cases, they should have known the judgment was coming and they didn't. It is not just that they were indifferent. They were not expecting Christ's return. It's that they were not uh, anticipating that there would ever be anything to change the status quo. Uh, they were comfortable with their sin. And Noah's message that God was going to send a flood that would destroy the world was easily brushed off. And Lot's warning to his son-in-law, his son-in-laws, that there was going to be a judgment that would destroy the city was laughed off. But in both the cases, these civilizations were so incredibly corrupt. How could they not know? How could they be in blind indifference? Did they think there is not a God? Uh, did they think there was not a God who was indignant with human sin? Did they think God did not care? Did they think God would allow them to go on forever mocking His righteousness? Destroying the righteous? They should have known. But they didn't. Uh, and so what did they do? Things people do every day. Another day... We're going to do the things we do. If we plant or sow, we're going to do that. If we do commerce, we're going to do that. Lot's wife making wedding preparations and looking forward to the big day. And it's all just going to continue on like it is forever. And I think Jesus' point here is, how could they be so blind and indifferent? How could they think that they could get away with what they were getting away with? I think of what Paul wrote, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And the same is true of civilizations. But they were living their lives in blind indifference to their own sin, presuming upon the patience of God, and assuming that His silence must mean that He didn't care. Or maybe he was indifferent to it. And we read that they became more and more brazen, more and more vile. Finally, the sound of their wickedness was echoing throughout heaven itself. And to check out one more time, to be sure it's really that bad, angels were sent. And they're saying, the echoes that have been heard in heaven are indeed correct. It's time for the total destruction of this civilization. The one righteous man has been removed and now the judgment falls. And one of the applications I think we should take from this is that we need to be very careful that we do not become like the rest of the world, indifferent. 
to the growing wickedness of our culture. Uh, thinking that it's all going to continue on forever. That God doesn't care. That God doesn't see. That God doesn't know. That surely a God of love would never do something like this. Remember, Jesus was there in the form of the angel of the Lord as part of this fact-finding expedition. And we need to be careful lest we have an attitude like even Lot who even though he knew the judgment of God was coming had no desire to really separate himself from the wicked environment that had become his home he was a righteous man who had become, had become comfortable living in a godless society we have no choice, uh, you know, fastly, uh, quickly shrinking world to just go to the mountains or go to another city. It's everywhere. But at the very least, if we truly love God, if we are truly committed to the standard of righteousness revealed in the Word of God, we cannot allow ourselves to become comfortable in this culture. Peter wrote to Christians living in an equally corrupt culture in, the day, uh, in his day, Rome, people living in Rome. And he says, live out your lives as pilgrims and strangers. Are you uncomfortable in the world? Years ago, we used to have a song we'd sing at camp. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And that's all I'm saying. If we feel at home in this world, there is something wrong. Because we shouldn't. This world is no friend of God. And it never has been. And though we live here, and though we are to be involved in the lives of, of neighbors and friends and community, do you feel sometimes like, I don't really feel like this is even the place I was born in. I feel like this is an alien culture. You should, if you are truly a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. The other message that Jesus gave here is just a word of warning. And it has to do with the same thing. Remember Lot's wife. Here God had extended this extraordinary grace to her, to her husband, and to her daughters. They had been warned of the judgment so that they would have time to flee. They had been told that the judgment would not start until they had entered a place of safety. And yet, knowing all this, and warned not to turn back, she did. Because it was easy to get Lot's wife out of Sodom. But it was hard to get Sodom out of Lot's wife. And her love of Sodom pulled her like a magnet to turn around. And to long for what she had there. And I, I think this all ties together. I think the whole point of, of this, this indifference to the coming judgment when they should have been aware of it, and this idea that you can actually become such a part of a wicked culture that when you have an opportunity to separate yourself from it, you really don't want to do it. You know, one of our problems is sometimes we begin to love our sin. And we really don't want to turn away from it. 
And God pulls us away and says, now don't look back. And yet there is sometimes uh, that, that phenomenon that the sin has become so a part of us that it's like a magnet in us and it turns us back. And so Jesus says for Christians, he's talking to his disciples. Right before that passage, his, he said to his disciples, you're going to long for one of my, my days. And his warning to his disciples is, don't turn back. Lest you too suffer the pains of the judgment that is going to come upon the wicked. I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I don't believe a true believer can lose his salvation. But I believe that God still allows us to reap the consequences of our sin. And Lot's wife turning around in love with Sodom reaped the consequences of her sin. She too was destroyed in the destruction of the wicked. A warning by Jesus to his disciples. Remember her. And when you're tempted to love the world and the things of the world, when you find yourself falling in love with your sin and getting comfortable with it, remember Lot's wife. Be not deceived. Christian or unbeliever, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a person sows, that will that person also reap. Father, thank you for the warnings of your word. There are parts of the word of God that give us great comfort, and we thank you for those. This is one of those uh, parts of the word of God that doesn't really make us comfortable. Uh, but we need that too. Uh, we need to know that you are not a God to be trifled with. And that sin is not something to be played with. And that the wickedness of our culture is not something that we as Christians should ever become a part of. Because we are citizens of the kingdom of God. Purchased with the blood of your Son. So Father, create in us a homesickness for heaven. And cause us to increasingly become uncomfortable with anything less than the kingdom of God, our home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.